Hello everyone, good evening and a uh, warm welcome to the first uh, meeting by London Black Atheists. <laughs> um, first of all, we just want to say that, uh, my, uh, I just want to say that my name is Clive Arrowedy and uh, I'm the uh, organiser of London Black Atheists. I'm also a member of the Central London Humanist Group. Hooray! <laughs> who are um, helping us and supporting us on this uh, meeting. Now, London Black Atheists is a group that welcomes all atheists, uh, whatever the hue of their skin. Uh, the aim of uh, London Black Atheists is to encourage black atheists in London to come out of the closet. So that's why it's called London Black Atheists. We're helping London black atheists. It's not because you have to be black to join. It's like saying you have to be homeless to work in a homeless charity. It doesn't make sense. Okay? Um, so, uh, we feel that this is a very important and worthwhile endeavor because um, Europeans, by and large, are increasingly turning their backs on religion. Now, those spaces which have been vacated by Europeans are being filled up uh, by black and minority ethnic people. And we just uh, believe that if we can just stem the tide of religiosity in the black and minor minority ethnic populations, then hopefully religion will go into a serious downward spiral which hopefully will lead to its termination. <laughs> that's our, <laughs> that's our uh, very modest uh, objective. <laughs> okay. Now, um, with our honoured guest uh, today is uh, Leo Igwe. Leo Igwe is a Nigerian human <laughs> rights uh, advocate and humanist, specialising in campaigning against and uh, the effects of uh, witchcraft uh, accusations against uh, women and children. Now, for his troubles, he's been assaulted, imprisoned, threatened in all sorts of different ways, um, but his work goes on and uh, we'd just like to say how much we uh, appreciate and value his work and would like to support his work. He's currently engaged in uh, research into uh, these sort of areas, witchcraft accusations, and he's, and he's doing a PhD in Beirut, which is how the Germans say, or Beirut, as uh, us English would say, uh, Beirut University in Germany. Now, I'm sure you all know a little bit about, uh, you know a lot about uh, Leo, Leo Igwe, but I'll just mention briefly that um, he started off at the age of 12 in a uh, seminary to become a Catholic priest. Yeah, so it just goes to show that uh, reason will ultimately prevail, even in places like that, uh, because he became, as you can see, a staunch advocate of atheism, humanism, human rights, and so on and so forth. So, um, we uh, we just also want to mention briefly that uh, Leo has been working for years in this field and he's been receiving several awards and only just on Saturday, just this Saturday, just gone, 23rd of March 2013, Leo Igwe was awarded the National Secular Society Outstanding Achievement Award. Wow. And we'd just like to So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like you to put your hands together again for Leo Igwe. We'll take you. Thank you, Clyde, Hila, Jody, Lola, and uh, other friends at um, London Black Atheist Group for inviting me to 
address this meetup today. And thank you, friends, for coming. Thank you especially for providing this space for black athletes in London to come out and support each other without fear. And for correcting this notion that atheism is a white Western culture. It is not. Um, henceforth, when people say that uh, black people do not do atheism, you can now comfortably tell them that we do. I'm always delighted to meet with humanist friends here in the UK because of the role British humanists have played in my life. As a young Catholic seminarian, I read the books of British humanist Peter Russell and drew inspiration from his bold and courageous thoughts about religion. I still remember vividly going through the pages of his book, Why I'm Not a Christian, and admiring this great thinker. In the 90s, the reflections over the BBC by British humanists Nicholas Walter, Jim Herrick, John Wilson fired my imagination and emboldened me to take a shot at organizing humanism in my country, which I did. The decision to start the Nigerian humanist movement, dear friends, remains one of the best decisions of my life. The British Humanist Association, the Girl and Lesbian Humanist Association, the Pink Triangle Trust, the North East Humanist, the Central London Humanist Group, the National Secular Society, the New Humanist Magazine, the Free Thinker, and others have supported, generously supported our humanist projects in Nigeria and in other parts of Africa. And I must tell you that on several occasions, they saved me from burning out as a humanist leader and the organizer. And for that, I remain very grateful. So I continue to work with British humanist Josh Koshinsky, whom I understand is also a member of the London Black Atheist Group. We moderate, along with uh, the Ugandan humanist Deo Gracia and E Group, the Human 2004 that promotes and publicizes news and challenges facing humanists in Africa and in other parts of the world. Of course, I'm happy to be here in London because it is the headquarters of the International Humanist and Ethical Union. And I must tell you that IHU is heavily represented here today. Uh, one of our vice presidents is here, the BHA director, Andrew Copsi. Where's Andrew? You can find him. Oh, yeah, he's sitting up there. Yes, good. And we have um, Colin Devens, the director at the IHU office. We have the communication director, Bob Churchill. Bob, good. Thank you for coming. So, friends, representing IHU in Africa was one of the high points of humanist activism in the region. And today, I'm taking part in an event, a special event, that we add to the list of what makes this city and this country special to me. So I come to London with a deep sense of gratitude and appreciation. I come to London with utmost sense of hope and optimism about the future of London Black Atheist Group and the free thought movement in this country. A few years ago, I met a man in Ghana who claimed to be a traditional African religionist. He was putting on some exotic costumes, some multicolored clothing and bits, holding some bits and pieces of ritual making tools. He was pretending to have some supernatural powers and to be communicating with invisible forces. In the course of our interaction, he asked me the religion I belonged to and I, and I said that I had no religion and that I was an atheist. I was surprised. I asked him, I said, look, are you not an African? <laughs> yeah, friends, for this man, and for many people in Africa, being an African means that I must profess a religion within him. I must profess believing in God, even when, according to Laplace, I find no need for that hypothesis. I guess this could happen to any black atheist person anywhere in the UK or in the world. When you introduce yourself as a non-believer, there's a tendency that some people would ask you, huh, 
Do you really mean it? Why? What happened? <laughs> Are you not a black person? <laughs> People query you and make it seem as if if you are a black person and an atheist, you are not truly black. <laughs> as if something is missing in your black nature. <laughs> as a black person, one is expected to be religious and to be theistic, to belong to one of those theistic groups, professing no religion. Being an atheist, agnostic, skeptic, or free thinker is imitating white and Western people. But friends, this is not the case. And that is why we need the black atheist space. Right now, things are changing. Things are slowly beginning to change, as you can see here today. We are meeting here at an exciting moment in the history of free thought in black communities worldwide. In Africa and the United States, black non-theists are coming out. Atheist agnostics, free thinkers in black communities are beginning to organize. They are making their voices heard, even though the situation remains dangerous. Particularly for atheists from evangelical, Pentecostal, Christian families, and Muslim communities. Many free-thinking black people are leaving the courses and going open and public with their free thought. There is a growing visibility of black people who are godless and proud. And I hope all that closes and atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers in other parts of the UK, Europe, could emulate this initiative and join efforts with us in breaking the taboo of atheism. Taboos are control mechanisms employed to hold people in ignorance, fear, and servitude. Taboos are used to keep people in the dark and to stop them from questioning, from thinking, from inquiring, from acquiring new ideas, from exploring new frontiers of knowledge. And these are what people in black communities need. From going intellectually and morally, taboos are weapons to silence the critical voice and to shield, in this case, theism's false and questionable claims from critical evaluation. So that's why we need this space. That's why we need to break the taboo of atheism. So I want to salute all of you, Clive, David, Jody, Lola, and all who came together to start the London Black Atheist Group for this thoughtful initiative. I believe that the London Black Atheist Group, like Clive said, was not formed to organize atheism along racial or color lines, but to put in place a free thinking mechanism that addresses the needs of people in black communities. And as you know, these needs are many and they are growing. Many atheists in black communities are yearning for safe spaces where they can come out and express themselves as atheists, exercise their full human rights as human beings, and contribute to the growth and development of their communities. But they cannot find this space. Atheists are denied their basic freedom as a matter of norm, law, tradition, policy, and piety. So that's why we need this space. In many black communities around the world, atheists cannot meet the way we are meeting here today. They cannot identify themselves publicly as we're doing today. Those who institutionalize athe atheism make atheism a thought crime, as Christopher Hitchens used to say. And for a purpose, in order to maintain theocratic tyranny in the world. Those who organize theism in form of religion made atheism a scary, frightening, and horrible idea in order to perpetuate religious privilege, superstition, and ensure that the fallacies, delusions, and pretensions of theism go unchallenged. That's the purpose. Theistic teachings are treated as dogmas which they said we should not question, even though we have questioning abilities. So shut it down. Questioning them, questioning them is an act of blasphemy, which is a crime punishable by death in many countries. Making mockery, sometimes of religious laughable claims, is a capital offense. Somebody will tell you, oh, Prophet Muhammad, at the end of his life, went 
to whatever, heaven or whatever, in a flaming horse, and they tell you you should not laugh. <laughs> oh, can I mean? I mean, I just find it difficult to understand. <laughs> and you should not make caricature of it. But that thing itself, is it not a caricature? Telling me that somebody who went to heaven in a flaming horse, is not a caricature on this one? And when they make caricature, when they tell you those things that are caricatural, they say, don't laugh. So friends, that's why we need this space to challenge religious privilege, to question religious claims, and make mockery of religious doctrines when necessary. There's many things in the forbidden fruit. And they command the faithful not to eat it lest they die. But friends, I want to ask you, do people really die by taking the forbidden fruit of atheism? The answer is no. Many of you here have taken that forbidden fruit. Are you dead? <laughs> you are not. But friends, some of our friends who have eaten this fruit are dead or are living under the threat of being killed. Not by the poison contained in the fruit of atheism, but by poisoned minds of some believers. The ubiquitous self-sized soldiers, militants of God or Allah, who are ready to spill the blood of any real or imagined infidel at the slightest provocation. These divine mercenaries leverage on a system, fetch system, that treats them as saints, not scoundrels as heroes, not bloodthirsty criminals, as normal, healthy human beings, not psychopaths. These religious bloodletters are motivated and mobilized by their theocratic backers and funders in this world, and by a God that promises them post-mortem rewards in paradise. That's why we need this space. Theistic regimes use force and intimidation because they know that theistic claims rest on a weak foundation. And it's based on flimsy evidence. And therefore cannot withstand any serious challenge of scrutiny. They know that many theistic claims are absurd <laughs> and can get intelligent people, thoughtful people, to draw up cartoons and make caricature of them. They know that it is only in a situation where atheism is a taboo that theistic nonsense and absurdities could thrive and flourish. A statement recently credited to a Sunni Muslim leader, Yusuf Haranawi, says, if we didn't kill the apostates, Islam won't exist today. Friends, why should Islam or any religion need the blood of apostates or infidels to remain in existence? What, what should keep Islam or any religion in existence is not the killing of non-believers, but the validity and veracity of his claims, the persuasive nature of his teachings, the force of his examples, not his bloodshed, not fear, not fatwa. A truth claim does not need violence to prove or preserve itself. The force of logic, fact, or evidence does not need the force of arms to exist. It is error, not truth, they say, that shrinks from critical examination or inquiry. It is only a lie or falsehood being propagated, being foisted on people as truth that can be kept in existence by force. Muhammad died and was buried somewhere. No, Muhammad died and he went, to, he went to the sky in a flaming horse. Take it. That's the truth. At one point. That's what we're, that's what we're being held hostage. And we're told to hold on to something which we know is false. If there were truly an Allah, there would have been no need for a jihad, no need for Sharia law, Sharia courts, or Sharia police. Allah does not need anybody to defend him or how it. Allah does not need anyone to fight for it. If, if some people must defend Allah, it must that Allah must be very weak 
Oh, he's not there. He's not there. Yeah. If there were a God, there would have been no religion, no popes, no bishops, priests, pastors, prophets, divine messengers, sheikhs, mullahs, ayatollahs, imams, theistic establishments, they are aware of this. They know that their emperor has no clothes, though they insist he has. And that is why they need and use force, violence, threats, and intimidation to keep people from acknowledging the fact of their emperor's nakedness. Or from questioning other counterintuitive notions which about the source of their sacred text, the birth and life of the founding prophets, and what happened to them at the end of their lives. Hence, the outlawed, criminalized, haramized, immoralized, and signified real or imagined atheism. Many Christian believers often cite this biblical verse, Psalm 14, verse 1, which says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Now, imagine if we are to rewrite that statement to read, The fool has said in his heart, Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Or the fool has said in his heart, There is no other God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet. Hell will let loose. Yes. But people can comfortably say, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God, and laugh. Definitely there's something wrong somewhere. So friends, one will be accused of offending the sensibilities of Christians and Muslims, as if atheists do not have sensibilities at all. The statements will be taken to be racist, or expressions of Christianophobia or Islamophobia, particularly Islamophobia which is enough to get fanatics raging, rampaging, going on a killing spree, burning embassies, murdering diplomats, while the moderates stand by, watch, and castigate those who provoked their fanatics. You caused it. Why did you provoke them? <laughs> they are sick people, <laughs> so you don't need to provoke them. One will be accused of making denigrating statements about religions when scriptures and sermons preached in mosques and churches are filled with denigrating statements about non-believers and apostates, about women and children and gay people. Few people are sensibly offended. Few people are sensibly offended when religion is used to sanctify witch hunting, homophobia, subordination of women, genital mutilation, the killing of non-believers, the persecution of minorities, extortion and exploitation, fraud and deception, sexual abuse, or domestic violence. And this is particularly the case in black communities. And that is why we need this space. We need a black atheist space. And that is why what we have embarked upon here at the London Black Atheist Group is a laudable project with great promise and possibilities in terms of change, intellectual awakening, reformation and transformation in black communities. Friends, let's face it. If there are people who should be religious and theistic in the world today, it is not black people. If there are people who should be flouting their Christian or Islamic religiosity, piety, and godliness, it is not people in black communities. But the irony is that black people are reputed to be the most religious people on earth. And Africa has severally been polled to be the most basic region in the world. The experience of, pe of black people in history, even today, makes the existence of a loving, caring God of, of the religions untenable. So you, just, you don't need all the arguments. You don't need to debunk theological arguments, the causality arguments, and all that. No, you don't need that. Just go to the black communities. You just see the you see God, the existence of God being disproved every day. Many people still maintain that religion and God were responsible for the abolition of slavery, for ensuring the success of civil rights movement in the US. They often use this claim to support during public debates the fledging notions of theism or religion. But my question is this. Where was the Christian God during the transatlantic slave trade? Where did 
brief a Christian God today? Where was the Muslim God? Where was Allah? During the trans-Saharan slave trade that is still going on, even in Mauritania and Sudan. Where is the Muslim God today? Is Jesus on the side of Christians in northern Nigeria? Is Allah on the side of the Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, and the jihadist campaigns? If not, why not? We need to ask these questions, friends, and that is why we need this space. Does it mean that a benevolent and merciful God looks away, goes to sleep, and allows evil and terrible things, terrible crimes to be committed? And at a point, after some days or weeks, months, years, decades, centuries, she wakes up and comes to his senses and decides to stop them. Friends, what kind of God is that? I mean, how does one reconcile the idea of a personal God who hears prayers and the idea that religion provides black people? Religion provides black people with a sense of meaning and the existing and persisting state of poverty, misery, hunger, despair, crimes, conflicts in black communities. What kind of meaning or hope does religion provide black people? What kind of God do black people worship? What kind of Allah do black Muslims worship? What kind of Jesus do black Christians pray to? We need to ask these questions. We need to start asking these questions. And that is why we need this space. Even from the history and experience of people in the Middle East, the God idea makes little or no sense. Many Palestinians and Israelis are Yahweh, God, Allah, Christian believers. And they have been fighting for decades in a particular small portion of the world, chosen by God, we are told to produce the greatest prophets of the world religions. And none of these prophets has shown up <laughs> and tried coming down to resolve the conflict. Imagine, this has been going on. Look, Jesus has just tried. You went to heaven from there. Muhammad went to heaven from there. None of them could just take a flight a flight back. And he turned flight and said, OK, sorry, sorry, he said, no. <laughs> You rely on Obama, you rely on W. Bush, you rely on Tony Blair, they will do roadmap. After that, when they voted out of office, roadmap, roadmap. And what are they fighting over? They're fighting over patches of, of land that, you know, people, are, people think that something maybe extraordinary happened, supernatural happened. The God, they, the God who said, or whom they claim, manifested there, is quiet. He doesn't know, okay, sorry, oh, Muhammad did not go to heaven from this part of land. Okay, Arabs, you can stay here. Okay, Christians, you know, you are Yahweh. Abraham did it. I mean, it's very simple that we tell you that this God is important. He doesn't, I mean, he's not there. This guy is not there. So, friends, God himself has not shown up. The prophets have not shown up. The same thing is applicable to the conflict in Northern Ireland. In which side was Jesus in that conflict? The Protestants, right? Or the Catholics? I'm sure that even the discussion could even lead to conflict. <laughs> now, if today many people across the world are reluctant and fearful of speaking out against the excesses of Christian churches and Islamic groups, against the abuses going on in the name of religion, black people should not. Why? Because it is people from black communities who are suffering most from these excesses. That's why we need this space. Now, if you observe carefully, the global war against terrorism has been misconstrued to be a battle between Islam and the West. It is not. Is rather a battle between Islam and modernity, Islam and human rights, Islam and human civilization in the 21st century. This miscategorization has been used to polarize the world and garner support, mobilize resources from both sides. 
the Western nations, the NATO, the fighting, then the Islamic solidarity is being used to mobilize people in Nigeria, in Mali, everywhere. The jihadist movement is a global movement that has been wreaking havoc in many countries outside the West, including Islamic countries, since the time of Muhammad. As far as I'm concerned, Muhammad was the first jihadist. Now, if anyone says that the fight against terrorism is a case of Islam versus the West, then where does Africa come in? Where does the situation in Mali? Where does that come in? The situation is not in Nigeria. They will tell you, oh, the situation is not in Nigeria, it's a local problem. But it became terrorism as soon as they kidnapped foreigners and people from Europe and America. That's it. How does one explain the violent campaign of jihadists in Somalia, Sudan, Mali, Nigeria? Is that also a case of Islam versus the West? Where is Islam versus Africa? Where is Islam versus people in black communities? So friends, when they articulate global discourses in a way that seem as if people in black communities do not matter, we should tell them we do. That's why we need this space. <laughs> Hence, I want to use this opportunity to call on all atheists, skeptics, agnostics, rationalists, brights, in black communities to come out and join the growing community of free thinkers here in the UK and other parts of the world. We cannot wait any longer. Why wait for too long? We cannot further delay this out campaign. And I enjoy all our non-black friends who support the idea of having an effective free thought mechanism in black communities to come forward and lend their support to this important project. Who knows? The communities you have today enlightened may one day become your own, or that of your children, or that of your friends. We need to break the taboo of atheism because the evidence of God's existence is simply not there. Now think about it. Many Jews are still expecting the Messiah, as I understand. And this guy has not shown up yet. Jesus, whom Christians believe is or was the Messiah, I don't know, apparently disappeared into the clouds and his actual fate remains unknown. Even though many Christian believers are expecting him to come back soon, soon, nobody is sure that he got to his destination. <laughs> and the messenger prophet Muhammad, whom we are told suddenly rocketed into the sky in the same part of the world where Jesus also trusted and disappeared into the clouds. There is no confirmation yet that he also got to his destination since he left on a flaming horse riding against the current of gravity. <laughs> no one knows if he actually arrived safely. I'm deeply concerned. <laughs> Or he eventually got there and decided to assume the position of prophet emeritus. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? God is not showing up. The prophets are not showing up upon all they did, all the miracles they did. They're not showing up. So, what are we waiting for? At a time, when abuses related to witchcraft, religion, and other paranormal beliefs are ravaging the black communities, <laughs> and people are so terrified speaking out against these atrocities because of fear of being attacked, or being killed, or being, or being called an atheist, an infidel, or a blasphemer, or being accused of racism or Islamophobia. At a time, many young People in black communities are embracing extremist, suicidal, religious ideologies. And religious charlatans, faith healers, witch doctors, marabouts, sound bombers, and other purveyors of theistic and paranormal claims are having a field day in Africa, Malawi, South Africa, Swaziland, Nigeria, Uganda. 
exploiting poor ignorant folks, spreading fear and resignation, inciting violence and hatred of anything or anybody Western. Breaking the taboo of atheism has become a social imperative, a moral and intellectual duty, with promises of peace in our troubled world. And of liberation, emancipation of people in black communities from the shackles of ignorance. Dogma, superstition, fanaticism, mental slavery, irrational fears, and blind faith. Friends, breaking the taboos of atheism will help us in our quest to rescue children. Abandoned, driven out as a result of superstition, driven as a result of witchcraft. We can also bring help and support to women. Like in this case, this woman was amputated. Witch hunters, they, they, they just cut off one of the legs in Malawi. And our, our friend in Malawi, George Tindua, has been doing a lot of work trying to change the tide, trying to bring hope, trying to bring uh, support to these victims. But you can only do it when you are not afraid of them. You don't think they are witches, or they will, they, or they will do something that will uh, you know, undermine your own growth or safety. So we are free from those fears. And we're not just breaking the taboo for the sake of breaking it. We are breaking the taboo so that we can be in a position sometimes to render help where others refuse to help. And again, not only in Africa, even right here, people in black communities can tell people in the UK, never again. Never again will a child like Christy Brown be tortured and killed. Never, never again. Never, never, never again. So friends, in conclusion, the black discourse is often presented in polarized black versus white or in a binary black and white man. The white factor is often construed to be the only friend or better, the principal dynamic that defines, drives, or makes the black text or the black talk meaningful. Personally, I find that approach too narrow, unimaginative, and unscientific. It leaves a lot unexplained about the black experience and the black world, about black people. This approach conflicts so many issues, including the diversity, dialectics, and dynamism, the contracts and contradictions peculiarities, uniqueness, particularities and commonalities in black life, history and experience. Hence, I'm so fascinated by the emerging dynamic of atheism or the black versus God debate. And I hope it will help us capture and shine the light on those aspects of black life, the black world and the black experience that have so far been hidden Ignored, forgotten, mischaracterized, misrepresented, and conflated into the often charged black versus white debate. So once again, I urge people in black communities around the world to break the spell of theism, not their TV screen. <laughs> You have everything to gain. Freedom, emancipation, enlightenment, confidence, self-esteem. <clears throat> you have nothing to lose but the chance. Thank you.
Yes, I, I agree with you that um, religious uh, uh, indoctrination is, um, is, a, is, a, is a major problem. I think that's, a, for me, it's a foundational tragedy. I don't know how else to say it. You know, when, when you, have, you have a foundation and you, have, you, got it, you get it wrong or something, you know, so everything we're doing, you know, it's like sometimes a waste of time. So, um, and we are making this move. Um, we have this um, uh, this schools in in uh, Uganda, but in Nigeria we also have a, just a secular school. You know, we have a secular school in, but it was established for a very long time. You know, since the since the fifties or so. So we have one. We hope to get more of that. But as, uh, as we understand, you know, having a school is not uh, just uh, something you could just wake up in the morning and you set it up. You know, there's a lot. And particularly when it's going against the current in the, in the society. So it, is, um, it requires a lot of planning, sometimes a lot of, re uh, a lot of resource, or, or it requires resources. Yeah, so we have one in Nigeria now and we hope to get more of such, uh, such schools. One way I would like to respond to that is that, oh, is a scaffold for, for survival? Are they surviving? Yeah. Go to Nigeria. Just go to the airport in Lagos alone. Yeah. Are they surviving? Criminality, killing, conflict. Are they surviving? If that, is that what you call survival? <laughs> what is going on in Nigeria? Is it survival? I don't think it's survival. Nigeria is smoldering. Nigeria is smoldering. Yes. So. So that is the, that's the situation. I don't think religion is actually helping. It's worsening the situation. Yes. Instead, religion is making people prone to being exploited. In other words, you can suffer, work, just earn very little, and one reckless pastor We just jump up and down and say some, some stupid things and collect the little money you got and tell you also to go and keep surviving. So I think that religion is actually taking advantage of the stress situation. So it is important that we may be able to understand that religion is not even addressing their stress. Yes. And we tell them what actually addresses their stress so that we walk towards it. There's no perfect society. There are poor people here. There are people on the streets. You see beggars still here. So it is important that we tell the society the truth as to how they will survive and not give them what they call the opium, which is not really helping them. He said it's, make, it's worsening the situation. That is actually what I think religion is not helping us to survive. He said it's complicating our problem. Yeah, well, I, 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 I I'll leave that for the London black atheists. <laughs> <laughs> because they are the ones best here. So they can take up such a campaign, but I will always be, you know, available. I'll always be happy to support and assist. Well, as you know, in my, my child's school in Carham is in Bethel Green. I mean, there's some man, you know, Muslim man in a big sort of beard and all that. I mean, he does leafleting outside the school gates of Ulum you know, come to the school after class and all that. And what, you know, we, I think we should, we should be targeting those schools and have a little bit of, you know, yeah. <laughs> Let us see who wins. Yeah. 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 Um, that's a, a really uh, interesting idea. The thing is that uh, there's some campaigns going on to, uh, for instance, uh, one of our guests here and a member actually of London Black Atheists is the author and uh, teacher, school teacher, uh, Alam Shaha, who has uh, written a book. Um, about uh, atheism. Now, there is a plan to distribute his book in every school. So, there are certain steps being taken, but um, as a group, I would say that at this moment, uh, we, not, we don't quite have the muscle to go around doing that kind of thing um, from school to school. But, as I said, it's an interesting idea, and uh, perhaps with our friends uh, in other groups, we may be able to work something out along those lines sometime in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I can only 
um, apply my own experience and how I became an atheist. I don't think atheism is like religion that you can preach or that you can teach. Atheism is something that it is a conclusion after, um, for me, after exposure to knowledge, as, after exposure to science, nobody um, preached to me or nobody told me um, about, about atheism. It's something that, it, it, it was a long, it took me a long time, but I, I made the conclusion from knowledge and I think the way we can influence the young ones will be through um, like a lot of um, black communities they have like Saturday um, schools. Um, they teach them the subject and then they teach them religion. I think we can, I don't know how we can get to that point to have like Saturday schools where we teach them reasoning. I think that is, we cannot teach, we cannot say to people there is no God. They have to come to it themselves. They have to make that conclusion. Um, well, what mechanism are you going to use to guide people who are ignorant, I think? Yes. Is to educate them. Yeah. You don't need to guide them, not to dictate, educate them. That's what you need. Educate, 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 keep educating them. That's it. I don't think there's any other thing, unless you, you have some other mechanism. Educate them, keep educating them. That's it. Then, um, can I say about um, Africa, I think what the um, secular society and um, a lot of atheist group are trying to do is what we need to do back at home, which is to um, influence government policies on education. The problem that we have, I can speak for Nigeria because that's where I am from. The problem that we have in Nigeria and that will make it very difficult is that it is now the churches that are predominantly religion, Islam and Christianity providing education in Nigeria. From primary school, we now have more universities in Nigeria than almost every house. Anybody can build up something and call it an university. So we have so many. Where do you start when religion is providing education? I think this is where we need to get into the politics of it, influencing the government to find a way of separating religion from education. Until that happens, they will get it from home, and then they go to school, they get it. I grew up as an Adventist. The Adventist church provided education for almost every member of my family, up on, until university level. Not only that, providing jobs for them. Without, without the Adventist church, I don't know what will happen to my family. So, and this is a church that teaches that the earth was made 6,000 years ago. So that is the that is the that is the foundation of our problem. I have no idea how we deal with it other than and I don't there is now this romance between the government and the churches. I don't know if anyone saw our president kneeling in front of one of the Pentecostal leaders. Yeah. Now um, I think I have issues with dogma. That's number one. I have issues with lies, falsehood. If somebody died, the person died and was buried somewhere. If you don't know where the person was buried, tell us, I don't know. Religion can never tell you I don't know. They will tell you God. You get it? They should, they should, they should, they should tell us the truth. I mean, is it, is it too much? If I ask the videos to tell us truth about its history, is it too much? So that is it. Now, you are talking about Judaism, and I understand that the Old Testament constitutes part of the Torah, but if I'm wrong, you correct me. Yeah, and Abraham is seen as a man who was faithful, right? And is 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 revered. And, I mean, you saw what Abraham, in quote, according to us, almost did. 
But the story is about yeah. The story is about doubting God's commandments, not blindly following. Yeah. What's no. No. You see. You see. You see. What I'm saying is that let's take that. that let's take that for instance. So sometimes, and if you read that, maybe some of this book of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, they say, kill these people, go to these people, we will suffer them. In fact, the, the, the verse that I use in, in Nigeria to 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 uh, promote or whatever to do all this in, in witch hunting campaign is from Exodus. Suffer not a witch to be. Do you get it? So what we're saying. Based on mistranslation. Yeah, no, 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 hold on, hold on. You see, you see, you see, friends, you see, let me take this ahead of mistranslation. Where is God? Where he's been mistranslated? Is he dumb? Why can't he speak up? Why can't he speak up and say, you have mistranslated me? Look at the correct thing. I mean, I mean, I mean, where is he? When they are mistranslating him. No, no, the point is the people who translate it. No, no, no. Where is God? Where is God who, who owns the world? Because as I'm here, if you misquote me tomorrow, I will tell you you have misquoted me. No, now the man was misquoted. He kept quiet. For how many years? 100? 200? How many years? He's been misquoted. He kept quiet up till now, and you're the one telling me he's misquoted. Yeah. Did he say anything? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the power of the internet makes things a little bit easier for people. But certainly, you know, you have people who make these translations incorrectly. You are still repeating the same thing. Why can't he correct those people? Why can't he correct them? You're asking us that we should follow some kind of religious moral principles. That's basically what you're getting yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But let's, let's have a look at uh, the uh, religious moral principles. Let's have a look. Uh, if we look at the prisons, they tend to be more full of people who are religious than people who are... Uh, the, yeah, the, the prisons tend to be more full of people who are religious than people who are kind of atheists. Do you understand? So, um, the people who are following religious principles, it hasn't helped them very much because the, pris uh, the prisons are full of them. Okay, now, let, 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 sorry, sit down, sit down. It's not ridiculous. I'm telling you the facts. When it subjects religious claims to critical evaluation, period. Yeah, but there are yes. people evaluation question question if, if if you are told if they say religion says this for instance like somebody says oh god is talking to me you say which language that's question yeah, but where do you get that how do you get past that um sanctified specialness of faith that faith is separate so i can be um, I have a PhD in um, molecular biology but i can be a christian you know and it's like how do you get past that kind of, you know, it's, it's incompatible with nothing. It's like, how do you kind of break that chain? I mean, it's just, it's just an open fall. I don't have the answer. I mean, but yeah, but for me, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. No, I know. You get it. There's freedom of religion and belief. Yeah. You get it, yeah. But when you bring your belief, I used to tell my friends, I'm a, when I believe in toy, believe in Muhammad, spaghetti monster, like Doc has been saying, whatever you want to believe, that's your business. But immediately you bring it out. To the temple, then you are exposing it to evaluation, and you can't shield it from evaluation. So that is it. So I support freedom of religion and belief. Yes, I also support the fact that if you make public claims, you can't shield those claims from critical evaluation. So <laughs> believe whatever you want to believe, but when you bring it to the public space, then be ready for that to be critically evaluated, <laughs> evaluated, <laughs> mocked, or caricatured. It's, it's got to happen. Just lose that automatic respect for religion. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, I, I, I'm not sure what that, I think what she is saying, what she is, if I, let me check if I understand you. I think what you are saying is that, how do we, people can be educated. For example, my, my father um, really likes science, and he introduced me to cosmology. And I remember watching a documentary with him, about, I can't remember what it was, I think it was about, um, I can't remember what it was. But my dad was saying to me, 
Lola, listen. Science is one thing. You need to learn science um, for, for a kind of knowledge, you know, to, to appear knowledgeable and to pass. But this is what Jesus said. I remember specifically, my father is highly educated, you know, enlightened, but he's still, this is where, you see, the, the chains, the chains is in education, is in welfare, and most importantly, in economics. It's wealth. <laughs> it is, it is, that is religion, whether, even though it is harming us, but we don't have a welfare system. We don't have, do you know why I am free to be an atheist? Because I don't need my family in the UK. I don't need to know anybody to be employed. I can get things on my own, my merit. It is not like that in the black society. You need the connection. That is where the answer to your question lies. Mm -hmm. Until people are empowered, yeah. they cannot, even when they want to think critically, mm -hmm. they cannot afford it. It's a luxury. Mm -hmm. If I'm back in Nigeria, I'm telling you, I don't know what I would do because it would be hard for me. We are dealing with crazy people, so I'm just trying to think, like, how do we deal with them, you know? Uh, yes. You see, um, there are so many issues involved here. Um, American evangelists are looking for um, members. They are looking for, you know, they want to, just like now, um, what's his name? This one that comes to Nigeria very often. I think he's getting old now. The Holy Spirit is no longer getting him to act the camp. Um, no, no, not big enough. Rehab, 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 okay. Yeah, Rehat Bonke, yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, many of them don't have the church members. <laughs> they, yes, many of the pastors here, or in the U.S., many of them, they don't have. But, you know, you come to something like Lagos, you go to Redeem, you'll be talking to thousands, sometimes on, on all that, and they have to carry the picture and say, Africa for Christ, or whatever, you know, and all that. So, they are losing relevance. You get it? In the, in the U.S. and all that. So, and here is a market already, ready-made market for them, you know. So, I think it's also sometimes, many of them have been in this profession for a very long time and are surviving on it, and the market is folding. It's closing now. The shops are closing in the U.S. and Europe. So, they are coming to Africa to, you know, to still sustain their market. So, there's a marketing factor. But it benefits both, because the local pastors there are happy to say, oh, Reverend whatever, Jack, Fuck is coming from Oregon, you know, to come and preach and spread the word of God. They will put the missile on, on, on all that, and a lot of them say, Oh, American evangelists are coming, they want to go and listen to him, and all even though they will not understand him, you know, because it's people with American accent. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, that is it. So, there is there's this kind of mutual benefit, you know, going on there. So that's why I said it's difficult to say how do you address it. You know, um, they're looking for a market. This is also looking for market themselves and all that. And at the end of it, or what does it boil down to? Money, you know, and all that and all that. So on both sides of it. So that's just the way I could I, I, I think about that. That's, that's what I can say about that. What's the biggest bank here? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, um, you see, the, I don't think that if we, yes, talk about, yes, money is what is going to define it. I don't think that is, is, um, is, is, is money issue, issue as such. Now, we're talking about a people, you know, sometimes who have the money, and they will go and donate it to pastors, expecting miracle from heaven. We're talking about people who will mismanage money in their offices and give it to God. So you also have to think critically, let me use that word, think critically about the money issue. You know, it is all about where, people, where people's value is, that's where they place their money. So I think, I'm deeply persuaded, but if we're able to promote our values and get people to understand that the values of critical thinking, science, 
reason, scientific temper, rationality, that they stand to benefit. If they accept that as their own value, they will put their money there. The money you think is in religion is not, Jesus is not the one sending it. <laughs> you get it? Allah is not sending money. But people have that money, but because their value is in dogma, value is in supernaturalism, value is in whatever faith, they put their money where, they, where quote, their faith or philosophy is. So if we're able to do that, persuade people, they will also put their money you know, where their value is. That's, that's what I think. No, but what my question was, right, yep. it's easy to talk to the people who are converted. Yes. And one of the things that was said earlier mm -hmm. was education in whichever Africa, Nigeria, I think it was mentioned, is being provided by the churches. Mm -hmm. It's because they have the money. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about changing the way people's values are, mm -hmm. it's about the way you educate them. Mm -hmm. So how, yeah, by saying yes, uh, you can tell this group of people yeah. that the, the dogma, the, um, the values are different and they'll put their money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But how do you tell the people who don't? Who yeah. elsewhere? How, what, what mechanisms? Yeah, but we have to start from somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I'm asking is where is that somewhere? Yeah, okay, now let me tell you where we have started somewhere. Right now we have four humanist schools where critical thinking uh, you know, is promoted and is taught as part of the curriculum in Uganda. Is four, not some, four, four schools, is not somewhere? We have one secular school in Nigeria. Taisho already had a secular school, and which is one of the you know, most popular, school, one of the popular schools in Nigeria. Is that not somewhere? Yes, we should not say, oh, this thing is so prevalent that we, are, we become hopeless. Unless you are not convinced of what they're talking about. I know that Africa will be better off, you know, with critical thinking, with scientific temper, with technological intelligence. And I will continue to say it. If they like, let them keep giving their money to pastors. That's their business. But I will keep saying it. And I know that any day they start putting their money where these values are, things will change. Otherwise, they remain where they are. It's a choice. I mean, we need schools, we need hospitals. Those two things, schools, hospitals, those are the stats. Yes, yeah, I agree with you, but, but also understand that sometimes what people profess shape also what other people do. Like, like the Pope, the, the retired, Pope Emeritus, huh? Yes. <laughs> yes. Now the Pope Emeritus, when he came, when he, when he visited Africa, you know, he was saying that the use of condom was, you know, uh, contributing to the spread of it. Let that thing can. Let me tell you, it can do a it incalculable damage. Yes. Like also some pastors. Yes. You you know. Uh, just excuse me, our friend. I'll I'll be here. You know, and if you like, I'll postpone my flight, you know, to back to Germany. <laughs> I, will, I, am, I am ready. I am ready to spend two hours this week with you. Just have patience. You know, there's no need to allow others to speak. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying there is that what these uh, people they look up to as uh, maybe for direction, moral guide, what they say, you know, sometimes they shape the actions of other people. They shape the decisions of other people. And that is why we have to always you know, critically evaluate, critically challenge, or whatever, whatever thing they're saying because of the influence, the negative influence like we, that was stated in the leaflet we got today uh, on the lives of many people. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure you have your own replies too. Yeah, but the, the thing there is that, for me, I used to tell friends when I travel around Africa and all that, I said, choose what you, what, whatever you're comfortable. You know, if you, if you think you're, you're comfortable with answering, and then it's fine. Skeptic. Some people ask me, are you a skeptic or a, a rationalist or anything? I say, I'm all of them. <laughs> yes. Do you get it? So I don't want to go into all those nuances of definition and all that. I only think that if you have a claim, place it on the table. I have the right to question it. Period. And if I evaluate it, then I can and I, and I come to my own conclusion. 
So I'm not interested in whether you call me a skeptic or humanist or atheist and all that. Whatever you feel comfortable with, please answer it. But let us apply the values of reason, critical thinking in all areas of human endeavor. Could I have an answer for you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I understand what you are saying, and I think we've discussed it several times. Um, even on my Facebook, I've not been bold enough to mention um, the title of today's talk. Um, I've tried to, to just say, oh, um, do you remember the documentary a few years ago, the human rights activist? I did not say exactly that, you know, um, the word. Because, you know, we are seen as, um, I think we were discussing it earlier on, satanist. If, 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 if you mention the word um, um, atheist in the black community, especially African community, um, I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> I really don't. Uh, everybody, everybody comes from a slightly different angle at this problem, you see? Some people are comfortable uh, using words like humanist, and then they'll come at it from that angle. And uh, some other people come from, uh, let's say, uh, they, they mock religion. In other words, they use jokes and other things to address the whole problem. Uh, other people are seen as a bit more strident or um, militant. That's another word, you know, the Richard Dawkins of this world, you know. Uh, I'm in the Richard Dawkins camp. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, I'm, I, I love the word atheist. I think it's very sexy. <laughs> Critical thinking. Is that a concept? Is that okay? Okay. Well, yeah. can I just say one thing? Okay. Yeah. I, I say to people, right, mm -hmm. simple um, reasoning is that some, if you imagine giving, um, explaining a concept to a 10 year old child, okay. if you can explain it to them mm -hmm. and they can understand it, mm -hmm. then it's reasonable because okay. everything else is probably bogus. So if you could try, you try not to use a word like critical thinking because the average 10 year old wouldn't understand that. Maybe yeah. it's simple. Okay, I want to make it simple. Are you there? Mm -hmm. I want to make it simple. Yeah. Questioning. Mm -hmm. Reward a child for questioning. Mm -hmm. Encourage a child to question and reward a child for questioning. Mm -hmm. And they can do it at 10 years. And you can do it at they can do it. Yeah. Teach a child to do the, teach a child to yeah. question <laughs> and reward a child for questioning. Mm -hmm. Think about the answer. Think okay. Yeah, thinking about the answer with the time. Uh, you know, what, how, what, how, what do you replace? How, what do you replace the crowd? Because I had that problem when I, when I defined myself, when I finally de defined myself as an atheist. And I was really scared, I was lost and everything. Mm -hmm. Then you replace it with the thing that you love but did, didn't know, didn't put, did not attach due weight to. Music, art, groups, that's, that's how I found the Central London Humanist Group. Poetry, book clubs, things like that. And you'll be filled up. You'll, you'll be satisfied. Okay, uh, my friend, sorry. My friend, um, the essential thing, the thing that binds all the uh, atheist, humanist, secularist groups together is evidence. Teach your children to always look for evidence and to ask for evidence for any claim, any claim, especially religious claims. Because if, if, and you should believe whatever you're told, if you're being rational, because the basis of the word rational is ratio, so you should believe what you're told in ratio to the amount of evidence that is given to you. If there's no evidence, there should be no belief. And trust me, 
We've been waiting for 2,000 years for any evidence <laughs> of religious uh, claims, and we've had absolutely nothing. So you should believe it to the same extent. Nothing. Anecdotal evidence is not good enough. Yeah, yes. Teach them what evidence means.